So good morning, everyone. I'm Ugo Guarnacci. I'm a program manager at the European Health and Digital Executive Agency, which is a newly created executive agency of the European Commission. And I am also coordinating a team within ADEA, this is the acronym for the agency, uh, on non-communicable diseases and mental health. And therefore, I'm delighted to be here with you today because uh, this is a key project uh, within uh, the portfolio of our agency, in particular touching upon uh, depression and suicide prevention. And I'm very happy to be here and grateful for the invitation. So thank you very much to the EAD Alliance, in particular also to my colleague Corinne, that took up this project uh, from uh, a legacy, what we called in technical jargon, uh, meaning a project that was funded by the previous program that we managed. Now we manage the EU for Health, which is a pillar program on public health, but this project, EAD Best, uh, was funded by the third health program. So why I think it's very important for me to be here today, I'll try to uh, be brief and structure this speech around three main, let's say, pillars. First foremost, looking at your amazing achievements, because I don't think that one should be modest once you embark yourself in a three-year journey uh, where you, you know, face uh, so many difficulties, but also quite uh, substantial outcomes. Then I will try to also look at the sustainability of your project. How did you manage to anchor your outputs and outcomes within both the policy context, of course, of the EU, but also to to the other projects that have been funded uh, thanks to the EU for Health program. And last but not least, looking a bit of uh, some challenges ahead, uh, not because I want to conclude on a negative terms, but on the contrary, because I think the challenges are also a way to actually find new opportunities and to overcome these opportunities by looking at what is available in the European landscape. So when I look at your big achievement, I think uh, it's uh, actually uh, worth noticing uh, your effort on uh, putting community-based um, practices at the center of uh, um, uh, better uh, care for depression and also better and streamlined approaches to suicidal prevention. When we say community-based, of course, this has been a bit of a, a monolithic entity. We think that community are all equal. It is not the case. Communities have a different meaning in different countries, and that's why we focus on 16 different regions across seven countries. And I think this is also, it's already quite an achievement in terms of geographical scale for a project of our three years. It was also impressive in the number of training sessions, 100 trainings organized, mobilizing more than 4,000 uh, um, participants. And this is also very important because uh, you are actually trying to go like one step beyond the classic trainings and uh, actually uh, having community facilitators uh, embedding uh, this new framework within the community of the involved uh, countries is not something that we can take for granted. I think also a big step forward that EADBS has put forward is the uh, I fight for depression. This is a very um, uh, interesting tool for us. Uh, you know, the name of our agency is Health and Digital, and I think this tool uh, do showcase how um, actually two components of public health, mental health in particular, and digital are interconnected. This is a tool that uh, people can use in particular if they have uh, a milder form of depression. And it's very important because it's actually paving the way of a self-management uh, approach to care, which does not mean, and we all know that, uh, that we do not know, that we don't need actually the scientific people and the um, psychologists and our practitioners working on mental health, but it's also a way to showcase how today depression can be tackled from different aspects. And I find depression is definitely an uh, uh, important way to move forward with uh, 750, I think, new users, which is also quite impressive for the type of novelty of the tool uh, as such. Last but not least, in terms of achievement, I think it's worth mentioning also the four layers um, approach that you actually have been promoting quite uh, uh, consistently. So both at, of course, primary care, at the general public in the communities, going back to the community-based approaches, the community facilitators, and last but not least, I think what is the added line, um, value is also the four layer, the high-risk uh, patients, uh, their families and relatives. 
So how does it fit well in the sustainability approach that we put emphasis on? I think you anchor this integrated four-layer approach to the comprehensive approach of mental health, which is the new uh, commission communication that was adopted last year in June. And it's actually laid out on three main uh, pillars, which are prevention, access to better mental health care and cure, and of course the reintegration of patients in their own community. So you see already a, a nice uh, hook uh, in this new initiative of the Commission, but also the Commission has put lots of emphasis on the need to have a new European initiative on depression and suicide prevention, which allows you also to speak out and make your voice heard in this front. But also when you look at the sustainability in terms of joining a community of practice, you are well placed because you're already in a direct link with a project that has been funded by the EU for Health program, which is a measure. And in there, you are actually implementing the i fight depression for uh, these uh, vulnerable groups, in particular the uh, refugees uh, and displaced people from Ukraine. You are part of a cluster of four projects funded by a call, which was put in place uh, as a concrete and tangible response uh, to the um, uh, Russian war of aggression against Russia, against sorry Ukraine. And therefore, this is a very important way of demonstrating how this digital tool can actually actually help also people that are um, uh, unfortunately coping with a much uh, riskier situation than uh, average citizens uh, in the EU. I think it's also indirectly you are contributing to other projects, uh, even other legacy projects funded by the Third Health Programme, and uh, uh, for instance, uh, it's worth mentioning here the Joint Action Implemental has been a member state joint action led by, coordinated by Greece, where member states are uh, implementing two best practices. One of them is extremely linked to what you're doing, because one best practice is the Belgian uh, reform of mental health, basically de-hospitalizing uh, the context of mental health cure, and actually proposing community-based um, centers where people coping with mental health, struggling with mental health problems, uh, can be better placed but also the Austrian best practice on suicide prevention, which is uh, close to exactly what you're trying to, pro to propose in a different way, of course. That's why we have different projects, but still in a nice complementarity and synergies. So moving towards the end of my intervention, I think it's also... Um, important to reflect on the challenges. As I said, you know, synergies, uh, you're well placed, both in policy and in program and project perspective. The challenges I see are twofold. On the one hand, uh, you are an alliance against depression at the European level. It is important that you sustain the network uh, consistently and with a kind of a solid basis, because it's important that not only you keep uh, the members that are already part of your network uh, um, engaged, it's also important that you reach out to new uh, regions in particular, looking at those that are particularly prone to the risk of depression, which re remain a pivotal challenge uh, for the European Union as well. And the other big challenge is uh, how do we ensure retention? Retention of uh, those trainings and people that you trained uh, uh, within the community-based uh, approaches uh, for suicidal prevention, for instance, but also retention of those users that have been using the iFi depression tool, because it's important that the retention is actually um, sustained throughout uh, your work, that we do not forget about the people we had already trained and already used our tool, because sometimes, uh, and this is also a self-critique through projectification, we tend to forget what we achieved in the previous project. So it's important that actually retention and sustainability goes hand in hand. But I don't want to conclude on a negative note. I think, as I said, challenges are always linked to opportunities. And in here, I do a bit of self-promotion on one of the biggest programs that we manage in Adea, which is the EU for Health. But the EU for Health is also structured in a way that offers several tools and several different types of grants. So we have the so-called operating grants that are grants for non-profit organizations like uh, EAD that 
can actually allow you to still sustain your daily functioning uh, throughout the uh, work on the public health sphere. And we are very happy to see you continue engaging and applying as a main beneficiary because this is also part of what a community of practice does. Once you enter the community, you also want to uh, try to win the bid and uh, uh, be the lucky one, but also the uh, open call for action grants that we keep having uh, on how to address mental health, also vulnerable groups, not only the refugees and the migrants, as just mentioned, but also other groups that are quite well named within the calls that we have, for instance, uh, Roma people, uh, children, uh, uh, women uh, that are particularly prone to vulnerable contexts, uh, and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, you are well placed also to a better deployment of the IFI depression tool for those vulnerable groups. And uh, uh, in particular, looking at the health inequality and stigma, where I think your expertise can be, of course, of added value. So good luck, of course, for the future ahead. I think it's kind of a rosy future if you look at the number of applications you put throughout uh, in, the list, in the recent year for EU for Health. So finger crossed for that. And uh, congrats uh, and thank you very much again for the great results you achieve in this journey of three years with us. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, Mr. Guernacci, thank you very much for coming first and for these very thoughtful and kind words, which have really uh, touched the important points uh, we are struggling with and also, I think, the positive outlook we have. It's for me a great pleasure to look in this room, a really great pleasure, and I speak also for my whole team and I think the whole consortium, uh, that so many people have come guests who apparently are interested um, in what EAD Best has done and what EAD is doing. And the aim today is to share lessons learned in the last years with you. So we try to avoid um, too much frontal talks. This will be uh, only a small part of this meeting, of this final event. But we want really to share in a very concrete manner how to implement a community-based intervention, what is important, uh, what are elements, how to do it, what are the steps. We, we try to be as concrete as possible, and I think one of the strengths of EAD always has been that we have always taken care that what we are doing comes to the people who are really in need of it. So I see it's coming. Before... Um, Coming to the intervention, I would like to share with you some aspects concerning depression and suicidality, because depression is a disorder which is very complicated. Most people have, allow me to say it, a naive understanding, and I had also a naive understanding. Uh, depression is a real illness, it's a brain disorder, it's something different from not feeling well. And this is very difficult to understand. Um, Therefore, I, I want to share it because it's the basis of what we are doing, that we have something like a common understanding. It's prevalent. About 6, 8 percent of the adult population is affected by this illness every year. It's severe. It's life-threatening. If someone has a diagnosis, life expectancy is reduced by 10 years. These register studies show this consistently from Scandinavian countries, for example, um, females are affected um, around two times more often than males. Um, it's, of course, very costly, uh, sick leave, early retirement, presentism, um, these are important factors. And what calls for action is the fact that good treatments are available antidepressants, psychotherapy, but are used in only a small minority in a guideline-oriented manner of the people affected. And this constellation, a severe prevalent disorder where there is treatment which is not used, this constellation defines the room for improvement. And if there's a big room of improvement, it makes sense to invest resources to um, improve the situation. So we have a a good chance to get a lot of return for your money, so to say. 
Um, it's closely linked to suicidal behavior. And um, I want to uh, share with you this um, slide which shows the suicide rates in different European countries. You see there are big differences uh, for a variety of reasons, but what you see here is that males have always higher suicide rates than females. You might ask if depression and other mental disorders is so important for suicide and females are more often depressed, why do they not have more completed suicides? The answer is females in general have uh, make in most countries more attempted suicides, but they do it in a much less lethal manner. Um, so the male do it uh, with more lethal methods and even within the same method, they do it in a more lethal manner. This earlier study uh, of EAD has clearly shown. Um, so the, the suicide rates are uh, determined to a large degree by the method chosen, because we have 20 times more attempted suicides than completed suicides. This is um, something which is also important when you want to start a community-based intervention. What is the relationship between life circumstances, life adversities, depression and other mental disorders, and suicidal behavior? Most people have this model in mind. Most people. And I, for me, it was the same. You believe that um, yeah, stress, unemployment, or, or working stress, or uh, relationship breakups, uh, this causes depression and this causes suicidal behavior. But the model which um, is more correct, and I can provide good arguments for that, is that the causal errors are stronger in the other direction. Depression is causing relationship breaks up. Um, depression is causing unemployment. Depression is causing a variety of somatic disorder. Depression and other uh, psychiatric illnesses cause suicidal behavior. This is very difficult to understand. Uh, when you work as a psychiatrist, you need some time until you really understand what depression is. You see patients um, who have a very difficult life circumstance and are depressed. You start treatment with antidepressants and psychotherapy, and after some time you see hope come be comes back, sleep comes back, uh, appetite comes back, um, but the uh, patient gets out of depression in spite of still being in a very difficult life circumstances. You see other patients who have a depressive episode and suddenly overnight they skip into mania. There is changes in brain mechanism and suddenly they are manic. And you see all the ideas you had why he's a depressed are not true. The mechanism which makes it so difficult to understand this is that when we would now fall into a depression, depression would look around in our lives, what is there negative in our lives. And in all of us, it finds something. And it starts to make it perceived in a catastrophizing manner, linked with hopelessness. And then, of course, people think uh, that <clears throat> the problems they have, for example, work stress or relationship problems or whatever, uh, or a lower back pain, that this is the cause of depression. Of course they believe this, um, and also the surroundings believe it, but it's very often not the case, or it's overvalued and it's important. External factors have a certain value, but the relevance of it are very often um, not perceived in, in the adequate, in adequate manner. Only to share with you one study to make this a little bit, um, let's say, understandable for you, huge study in the UK. Uh, with about 600 uh, family practices, and all, all patient records were collected. It was uh, millions of patient records over years, and then over the time about 900 suicides occurred. And now it was possible to go in the records and look how many of the suicide victims had one of these severe disorders. You see here the, the disorders. And it was found that in the suicide victims, about 39% had at least one of these somatic disorders. And then a control group was formed, 70,000 people, also 
patient at the primary care level, of course not uh, dying by suicide, and here it was 37%, nearly the same. What is the learning? This disorder had not a major effect on suicide risk. Or go cancer, 3.4% of suicide victims had cancer. In the controls it was 3.2. A little bit different, but not a big one. So most people who say I cannot live with this cancer and commit suicide, they do not do it because of cancer. They are likely to do it because of depression or another somatic disorder. This is not easy to, to, really, to really understand. Or another Scandinavian study, um, here you see the suicide rate for the whole population of Denmark for people older than, male, male people older than 65. And the rate is uh, about 45 or so per 100,000 uh, people um, per year. And you see what increases the rate the most is depression. It's overtowering everything. Uh, also other psychiatric disorders is overtowering everything. And all the other factors play, comparable to that, a minor role. So for example, um, somatic disorders. It doesn't uh, influence it as depression. Or low income. Uh, uh, the, the income level had no major Im impact. Also, uh, being divorced and never married, and this increase might result from the fact that people with psychiatric disorders very often are never married, or that people who are alone have a higher risk to die by suicide because there is nobody around who recognizes the risk and provides help. So this also, from a completely other database, supports what I'm saying. I, Stop now here, um, but I wanted to share this with you because it uh, shows it's important also to target psychiatric disorder when you want to reduce um, suicide um, in a certain population. Not only depression, but also other psychiatric disorder. The European Alliance Against Depression um, was an EU-funded project originally from 2004-2008. And I think we achieved the goal of sustainability um, and did it by forming a non-profit organization, um, the EAD, um, uh, as we have it now. And we continue with our aims to target depression and suicidal behavior um, and uh, to promote the implementation of the four level uh, intervention, uh, Mr. Guanacci has mentioned already. And we have done this in the meanwhile in more than 130 region, regions from 18 countries. At the core, <coughs> at the core is the four level uh, intervention. These are the four levels. I say some words immediately. Uh, but before you can start such an intervention, you have to form a network, a regional network in a certain community of a of a, a, a little town or even a, a certain district. And here you have to involve all people you feel they are important for such an intervention. This can be cariatic caregivers, self-help groups, crisis centers, local health authorities, uh, social services, police, churches, schools, and so on. So you form a, a, a local network and then you start on this four level intervention. In the workshops, we will go into details here. So I will be short here. The first level is the primary care level, uh, mainly GPs who are the uh, professionals who see most people with depression and also suicidal um, behavior and um, tendencies. Uh, the next is the general public. You have to make in this region a public relation campaign. Key messages is depression can affect everybody or has many faces, can be treated. Um, there is the third level. We name it the community facilitators and stakeholders. So we have to train teachers, police, journalists, priests, um, pharmacists, caregivers, and others. It depends on the region who are core groups. And in order to do this, it makes sense to make a train the trainer session so that there are locally some people who are trained who give 
trainings uh, to others. Um, and the fourth level is the patient and the relatives, and we have a lot of self-help materials um, developed. And what is important, uh, I'm very short here, does this work? We made several control studies in the last years. Not all were successful, uh, but there were several studies which shown that the number of suicidal acts or the completed suicides went down when you implement this for level intervention. And we are very happy that in 2022, a completely independent research group from the US has made a systematic review, looking for the whole literature, and found that the only recommendable community-based intervention is this four-level intervention. So we are really um, an evidence-based approach, um, and this is a completely independent group. So for us, it was wonderful, of course, to get this um, um, yeah, this result. So when you implement it, um, you are doing something which is evidence-based. We have developed over the time um, in EAD a huge catalog of intervention materials. I think in the workshops later we can go in more details here. I have now to be short um, and uh, also an implementation manual, so if someone wants to start such an intervention, there is like a cooking book, what are the different steps, how to do it. It's available also in, in uh, many different languages. The iFi depression tool, which also has been mentioned by Mr. Gonacci already, is um, um, in the, an, a digital uh, self-management tool but uh, it's integrated in the IFD webpage. This IFD webpage um, is available in 21 languages, also in Arabic, in, uh, Ukraine, a Russian version, also uh, two African languages are involved. So it's um, uh, a multi-language website with a lot of information for patients, for relatives. And here also you can find the IFI depression self-management tool. Um, which is offered by healthcare professionals. So it's not that a patient with depression can say, I go to the internet and treat myself. The access is via uh, a health professional, a physician or a psychotherapist. This is necessary because these um, tools work only when there is guidance, professional guidance, someone who asks, did you use it? Do you understand it? Does it help? Do you have problems? This is important. It's available now in 16 languages, also thanks to EAD Best Project, where further language versions have been developed. And we have also a training for health professionals who want to offer this tool to their patients so they can uh, learn about the tool and can provide guidance. This is also something um, available, all for free, of course. So, Some, some lessons learned. Um, what we are doing is we combine two targets which are not completely overlapping. We combine the targets depression and suicidal behavior. And we will discuss in the workshop why this is important and why this makes sense. One argument is that so many people are affected by depression and that it's tricky to make an anti-suicide campaign because you never know what are unwanted effects. There might be secondary reporting in social media which are unfavorable, which are lowering the threshold, which might increase the risk that people die by suicide uh, because um, yeah, speaking about suicide is normalized. And I know personally many patients who still are only alive because they feel um, suicide is associated with a stigma, and uh, I will not do it to my family. I know many patients who live only because of that, and if you lower the threshold, um, there are some benefits if you do it, but also unwanted effects, and what is the balance? This is a very tricky question, but when you combine it with depression, then you can put on a focus on the topic of depression when you target 
the general public, and when you go to GPs and pharmacists and care caregivers and others, you focus also more on the topic of suicide. Yeah, to become active at four levels in time creates a lot of synergistic and also catalytic effects. We have published about it. We go more onto it in the workshops. The question is always how much top-down and how much bottom-up elements you need when you implement it in your community. It depends on the society. In some societies, you can do nothing without, uh, let's say, the uh, permission from the top. In other countries, uh, communities can do more or less what they like. Um, so you only need the approval, let's say, of, uh, or the support of the mayor and of people locally. So how much top down and how much bottom up depends on the culture and the healthcare system. Uh, you can start with a pilot um, project in a certain country and then offer it to other regions who might be interested. This is exactly what we are doing in EAD Best. Um, yeah, then you can establish national network. Do not involve pharmaceutical industry in order not to lose credibility. And yeah, so these are some of the lessons. Um, and here the best uh, comes really to an end in March. So this is really our final event. It has started in April 2001. Um, and we have here 10 consortium members. I think you can recognize them by bigger by bigger, how do you say, uh, patches uh, here, and please contact them, ask them what you like. Um, they are uh, wandering around and are always available for all questions you might have. Um, the aim is um, to transfer uh, the concept of the community based for lab intervention to other countries and also to expand it to other regions. So here you see there are some countries Bulgaria, Estonia, Greece, Italy, and Poland, who, are, who, who do not have a community-based intervention up to now, but now started in different regions. And there are other countries, Hungary, Ireland, Spain, who had already such uh, alliances, and they are expanding it to other, to other regions in their respective countries. And also, uh, we are supporting nationwide um, the implementation of the IFID depression tool. So this is the basic stru structure of EAD best And I think we have been quite successful in the short time. Uh, we have uh, in more than 16 regions started community-based interventions. We have uh, trained more than 4,000 community facilitators. Uh, the IFD tool already has been used by more than 1,000 patients. And the good is it will not end uh, um, now. Uh, it's the end of the project, but not the end of we have triggered. Um, but it's the beginning um, because uh, all what we have implemented, we hope, has long-lasting effects. So I, I'm at the end of my short introduction. And I think we have now still five minutes for, um, or, or yeah, I think one, two questions are very welcome. So thank you very much. <laughs> of course, we have in the workshops a lot of time to discuss. And also, here at the end, we have a, 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 a question and answer session. Questions need time to become ripe. Always, but yeah, Jose Luis. Yes, to share the news that while you were speaking, you were not checking your email, but we just got news that Mentbox was approved. That means that your slides are outdated. We have one more project to develop uh, this model in a vulnerable population. So th <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is really for us uh, very, very important uh, because up to now we are financed only by membership fee. So the, the, the partners in EAD, they pay membership fee. Uh, they, somehow they organize it. 
uh, also those using IFD, and of course this is always a struggle every year, and I hope we get a more stronger uh, basis um, for our organization, um, because we have a lot of ideas what we, we could do and what makes a lot of sense. So I'm, I'm very thankful for the European Commission for, for this support. Uh, thank you, Jose Luis, for <laughs> mentioning it. Okay, so we continue. It was not a question, but it was a nice news. Um, and now Rainer Mere, uh, our friends from Estonia, um, will um, speak uh, about lessons learned already from implementing the four level approach. So, Rainer, please come. Hello from my side as well. Um, I don't know which is more stressful to do, to talk to all of you, a nice audience that I have here, or to keep within my time limits, which I have been given. Uh, but I will try to do both fairly well. So hello from my side. Um, I will quickly and briefly talk about what we have been doing over the past three years in different countries, um, and I think exceptionally well as well. Um, I will have a brief overview, but later on, of course, if there are any questions or in the workshop, we can go into more detail. So, very quickly, why it's important. Um, suicide is the, is the most, I would say, prevalent mental health disorder. It's an actual disease. It's not just not feeling well one morning, but it's an actual disease, and it's very important to tackle this as well. And it, to do this on a sustainable level, over a long period of time, a multi-level strategy for suicide prevention makes much sense. And this is something that we have been implementing, and I want to share with you the key lessons learned as well. Before I go and talk about the key findings, um, and there are five, I would just quickly want to go over as well what were the actions that we did. We spoke briefly about the four level interventions, then I want to talk about what those interventions were. And, and then I'm going to talk about and share the key findings, and I hope you find them useful when you want to start your own regional alliances when you go back home to where, wherever you came from. So, uh, and thank you for taking the trip and the time to come here. All right, so first off, first level, general practitioners, mental health experts, um, and people who, who are at the forefront, basically. Um, what we did was we did many, many trainings for them. Uh, and it's very important to train the general practitioners as well. IFD tool was mentioned, so we did IFD trainings for them. And in general, we um, spoke about the importance of managing and treating depression and really recognizing it as well. So that was one of the key components of the four level intervention. We had a public awareness and media engagement um, program as well. And this was for the level two, which basically is the general audience or general public. And well, in hindsight, I would say we had good results. Sometimes not everything worked as we wanted, but it never does. So for instance, one thing, we had a video that we created and we wanted to show it in public, in theaters, uh, before movies start, right, like trailers. Um, theaters were not that keen on taking up the idea to show those clips. So, but in one place where things maybe didn't work out as well as we wanted, in other places we did exceptionally well. For instance, we had opening ceremonies where huge amounts of people came together and, and we raised awareness and then word started to spread. So all in all, we had good results. And really important to, um, and I will just bring it out later as well, but the key component is also to talk to journalists and, and, and really educate them how to report on suicides, whether it's even necessary, and if it's so, how to do that in a decent manner. Gatekeeper training, or let's say community facilitators, people who get into contact with um, others who may be suffering from depression, um, again, training key community figures and the benefits are really um, there. Um, when they get into contact, whoever they are, with people who suffer from depression, 
detection and early intervention is key. So that, not that they will be doing any therapy, no, definitely not, but they will be, um, they may detect person may need help so that they can refer them to proper health care and, and treatment if necessary. And level four, focused support groups and high-risk groups. So we had uh, different uh, interventions and activities for that as well. Um, for instance, we had peer groups where people who suffer from depression and suicidal behavior, they could come together um, and share uh, their experiences in a safe space. And also, for instance, telephone support, suicide hotlines, we established them in regions where either there was none in place, or if there was some uh, already, already uh, telephone support available, we then shared this information with the local community as well, so that they would be aware and they could then get in contact if necessary. So this kind of covered one, two, three, four levels of interventions um, over the period of three years. Regarding special population, we had to really be mindful as well that um, we have to keep in mind the various demographics and be culturally sensitive as well. For instance, when we talk about um, the war between Russia and Ukraine, we had a huge influx of refugees. Poland, I think, was approximately one million. Estonia, approximately 80,000, and so on and so forth. And often, they also needed mental health support and support to treat depression as well. So what we did was we also um, used the tool I Fight Depression. We adapted it into Ukrainian language. Uh, and, and so we tried to kind of support them as well, and I think with good uh, results. So it was really important to be mindful of the various demographics as well, just as an example. And synthesizing all these interventions all together, what happened was we see a synergistic effect if we do this over a period of time. And um, I will talk about this later now uh, in more depth when I talk about the key, really uh, key factors that we learned. And those are five points. And when I looked at Professor Ulrich Hegel's points, they somewhat overlapped. I didn't know he was going to talk about those, but I'm going to do the same. I guess it's because they're important. So first, it makes sense to tackle both suicidal behavior and depression simultaneously, because they are both major mental health uh, issues in the community and in the society. So it's good to look at them both. And it's cost effective as well, rather to look at them one or the other. Um, so uh, depression is really prevalent, as was mentioned already before. So if we talk only about suicidal behavior, we leave a huge piece of the puzzle out. So we have to look at them truly together. Also, if we don't do some activities that we do, let's say in the uh, training journalists, it can have adverse effects, right? So if we, if we don't teach journalists to report on suicide um, in a decent manner, um, it can have adverse effects, and so on and so forth. So this is lesson number one. We have to look at them both, suicidal behavior and oppression. Lesson two, I would want to bring out, is that it does make much sense to focus on four groups simultaneously. Why? Because it creates a synergistic effect, what was mentioned previously as well. And what I mean by synergistic effect is, let's say, if we do trainings to level two, um, which basically is the general population, then what we see is level one, that is general practitioners and mental health specialists, and level three gatekeepers, they become more interested in what we're doing. So we do not only just raise awareness in the general public, but we also raise awareness for level one and level three, and now they become more motivated to join the trainings that we have for them. So this is also something that we have seen. So it kind of, all those pieces touch upon each other. The other is catalytic effect, which is also really, really important. So what we have seen and what can happen is that mental health experts, their interpersonal relationships and relationships to support people who have mental health issues goes up. Again, very, very good. This was lesson number two. Third one, again, was mentioned by Professor Ulrich, top down or bottom up. 
I'm a big proponent of bottom-up approach um, because what it does, it creates a feeling of ownership. So we have people who have come together, who have formed an alliance, and they are volunteers mostly, right? So they want to be beneficial to the society. They have come together and now they brainstorm. They come up with ideas. They want to do something for the greater good. And if they feel that they have ownership, they are much more likely to go until the end. And second of all, not just ownership, but also what happens is sustainability, which was mentioned before as well. If we want this to be sustainable, we want them to have the feeling of ownership. Three years have passed, this project will end. We have good networks happening. We don't want them to fizzle out now that the project ends. We want them to be sustainable. And, and one thing that helps this is the feeling of ownership. Lesson four would be finance, money, right? So we need money. I'm not going to tell you where to get money, but I can tell you where not to go to get money. <laughs> uh, it may be tempting, but pharmaceutical industries, yes, was mentioned before as well. So two reasons. First, pretty obvious, conflict of interest. That's there. And the second, it, you may lose credibility in the regions uh, if you ask money from pharmaceutical industries. So best not to go that down road. Yeah. Fifth, uh, it's nothing short of magic, I would say. So we have been doing these activities for more than two years. And what we have seen in each intervention country is that, and what I mean by magic is basically word to mouth. So we have been active in those intervention regions and doing all these in incredible things. And now what we see is other regions are reaching out to us and asking, hey, what are you doing there? We would like to know a bit more about what alliance do you have? Can we jump on the train? Uh, we want to start our own alliance. And this is how the network grows. And really, from each of the countries, we have at least one interested region. I think Poland is at the forefront here. Piotr, I'm not sure. Three or four spin-off regions have shown interest. Um, to start their own alliance. So they start in New Warsaw, and now there are other regions who have joined, who want to grow as well. So again, really helpful for sustainability. But now that you have those networks and those small bodies, you want to keep them alive, right? So again, it's a good idea to maybe have three to four meetings yearly to get them together, to really share experiences, wins and losses, so that again, they would stray, uh, stay youthful, let's say, or active at least. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> I promised you five. I'm going to give you six <laughs> because I have two minutes left. Um, and it's absolutely uh, important as well. So uh, you have to think on your feet. You have to be creative and flexible. When we wrote this um, document, in the initial phases, we didn't have a crystal ball to know what's going to happen. We didn't really know that pandemic was going to come. We didn't know that the war was going to start. But we had to then change some of those things that we did. We didn't lock down, for instance. Who, who wants to remember those days, right? But we initially had to start those regional alliances in a very difficult situation where we had to have meetings, if possible at all, over the internet. And you can imagine how busy general practitioners were during that time. And if you were going to go and ask them, would you like to join a Zoom meeting? Not really, um, you know. So it was difficult, but we managed really well. So be flexible, even if you have your plans, don't be rigid. That's going to create too much stress. That's it. So, yeah. Um, The precious picture I have of our team, of course, not everybody's here, but here we are in uh, almost summer slash uh, autumn Estonia. Thank you all. Thank you to the team. Wonderful three years. Thank you, European Commission. Um, 
Until next time. Questions, yeah. Thank you, Heather. Questions? I think an experience uh, which all have who start such an intervention that it generally is enjoyable. Do you agree, Rana? Absolutely. It's enjoyable because um, you come into contact with many, many uh, parts of the society you normally do not speak with. So it's, it's enjoyable. Uh, this is an experience many, many have. Um, perhaps, Rainer, uh, would you like to comment who would be well suited for starting such an alliance? But what, what do you think? What, who should do it? A, a politician, a director of a hospital? Or, or? OK, yeah, who would be well suited? I know two people at least, or three, who are in this room. We invited them over from Estonia. Um, hi. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody who's interested in mental health, you don't have to be a um, um, lifelong um, academic to start one. Um, you, don't, you just need to be interested. You want to make a difference in the society, but I think you have to also have specialists or experts on board, um, as we did when we started. So a group of different individuals and different levels helps, definitely. Yeah. I would um, also welcome all who have joined digitally. I have forgotten it at the beginning. And you can raise questions via the chat. And we will see your questions, and we will answer them. So please do not be shy. and ask questions. And here uh, there is a question. So the microphone is flying. Um, hello. Um, my name is uh, Maria Vaskiewicz. I represent the Federation of Catholic Family Associations in Europe. We're based here in Brussels and we represent the voice of families um, at the European institutions. And my question would be, um, in the course of your project, did you have any workshops, trainings, or maybe campaigns directed at targeting parents and teaching them or maybe talking to them, enabling them, giving them tools how to talk to their children about their um, mental health problems and issues? Because we've been seeing, especially with COVID and online teaching, that the increase of um, depression um, among young people. And I don't know, I wondered if you had that or if the alliances, they're also sometimes built by parents and started by parents. Thank you. Thank you. Good, great question. Um, one key group for sure. So level four, uh, basically people who may suffer or their close relatives, but also level two general population. So we did have um, in our intervention, but also other countries, special groups that we formed where, yes, as you mentioned, mothers, fathers um, could come and share their um, questions or their uh, concerns regarding their kids' health. Um, so definitely one big piece of the intervention was this, especially when we talk about um, Ukrainian refugees, for instance. So usually you would see from Ukraine mothers with their children. Um, um, so that was the, the main demographics. And then we would try to um, invite the mothers over for them to have a kind of group session where they could also then bring their kids along if needed, but they could also leave them somewhere. So I guess to be very short and specific, yes, it's very important. And if you want me to go in more depth, then just please find me. I have this badge here. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, just to add that we have worked in Greece. Hi. We have worked very closely with the Association for Families and Friends. So we organized um, in level four, many events and um, like art therapy events or even talks, at least five or six times over the last two years. And they engaged very well and uh, were asking for more. And we hope that they continue uh, what we started. Thank you. 
I'm, I'm Andar Sike from Hungary, and uh, I can also say that when we are co uh, collecting the, the community facilitators, we try to uh, invite families as well, the, the uh, associations of families, and of course, if they come and they have interest, we can we can give them uh, workshops. But it's not like uh, directly. Uh, a workshop for parents, but if there is a need, we can do that as well. So that's that's always uh, uh, a kind of bottom-up approach. So if there is an interest, there are uh, communities uh, of uh, families, then we are we are really happy to help them with this. It's a screen I see that um, Foda Sar from the Gambia. He is also, and I, I know him is also the uh, national representative of APAS, the African Project Against Suicide. Uh, and he is asking, are the interventions applicable for Africa? If yes, how do I get the resources? Um, yes, of course, um, the resources, this is a problem. If you want, implement a regional alliance, let's say in a region with 100,000 inhabitants or 200,000, then um, some resources um, are necessary. You need someone who is organizing all this and you need some costs for materials, public relation campaign materials and, and others. So. Um, most regions, for example, in Germany, are looking locally for sponsors. If there is not an EU-funded project going on, which provides the resources, um, so this is always, of course, um, a question which has to be answered depending on the specific situation. Uh, when I think about uh, Gambia, um, I'm not sure whether the uh, health ministry might have some possibilities. Uh, because a lot can be done by volunteers, so the costs are not extremely high and you do not have always uh, to do all what is possible, but you can also uh, uh, um, tune it down um, and let's say start first with only three levels or things like that. Uh, this is in principle possible if the resources are not enough. So, uh, dear Ford, I unfortunately I have not the, the, uh, the really perfect answer for you, uh, but this is something we also can dis discuss together in the, in the future. And yeah, so I think we continue. Um, we are not ahead in our agenda. So Piotr, um, Piotr Totski from uh, Poland, um, which is um, uh, leading all the wonderful activities in Poland. So, thank you. Take this. You, you want some more? I have it. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So uh, that will be about work package focused on IFI depression, the health and digital uh, tool combining both uh, qualities. Something which uh, supplements uh, really well this uh, four level intervention. Thank you. And uh, the for level intervention is quite analog. Uh, this tool is quite digital. In a way, it uh, gives uh, another dimension. And uh, I will give you just uh, for 10 minutes 20 short uh, lessons about how to bring it to the local level, hyper local level, but in some cases to the national level. Because I uh, observed, uh, I was uh, watching closely at uh, how this tool is uh, being deployed in eight different contexts uh, over 36 months. So all those lessons will be generalized in a way based on uh, those observations. So first of all, this uh, tool, it's good to have it ready before you start talking about it, because <laughs> when you over promise and uh, people wait and wait for months and uh, don't see it, uh, they get discouraged. So it's uh, maybe simple, even simplistic, but uh, translate, adapt culturally, and later start talking about it, because uh, there will be certain level of disbelief, like you uh, keep talking about something that is coming, but it's not coming. So uh, that's a really important lesson we learned in this project, because some partnerships were not built uh, just because of this false start, I would say, 
at least in the context which uh, I'm familiar with. Um, then, let's uh, move to the second part. Uh, show what is inside this tool. This tool uh, is made of six core workshops, several supplementary workshops, six uh, first workshops. Uh, they consider things like uh, seeking for pleasure, planning uh, pl pleasure, understanding links between affect behavior and uh, cognition in your life, uh, and uh, so on. But, uh, but there are also some PHQ-9 patient health questionnaire graphs. They monitor your mood, so uh, it's like self-testing uh, quite often and seeing what's uh, happening to your mood, how it's related to the events in your life, uh, how it's related to your sleep, uh, and, uh, and so on. So, Talking about it uh, as much from the inside, uh, currently I'm tempted to spend 40 minutes here showing it to, to you from inside, but we uh, don't uh, uh, have this uh, uh, possible right now. But uh, basically showing it from the inside makes you deploy it more efficiently than just uh, giving the leaflets and, uh, and leaving someone with the leaflet. Um, the third lesson is about uh, your understanding why it's guided, not stand-alone tool. Guided means that uh, someone who is certified as a mental health practitioner, either a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist uh, in national uh, framework of certification or psychologist in some contexts, uh, rarely crisis intervenor to that those people uh, hand in this tool to you. They set up the account to the patient and uh, they, in a way, uh, take care about what's uh, happening with the process. This is quite important then to understand before you start talking about it, why it's uh, working this way, why it's better together with uh, the real person than uh, if it was uh, self-made accounts and, and so on. Number four, it's about uh, emerging alliances against depression, and they may not be very much interested in digital tools first, because they uh, just set up, uh, they build a network, they have four levels uh, uh, in a way meeting for the first time, and you start talking to them about something digital. That's not why they met uh, in phase to bring something digital on board. So be patient, wait for it. Uh, also maybe uh, leave this tool for the second phase of your local implementation. That's uh, how, it, uh, how it worked uh, the best. Uh, now, remember that uh, I fight depression is both the website and the tool. Very often people see the website and say, okay, I self-tested, I know the tool, yeah, great tool, I will uh, keep recommending it to my patients. So they miss uh, the point. The real point is that they have to get the login credentials, they have to pass test, let's say, uh, 14 questions, not very difficult, but, uh, uh, but they require you to watch uh, at least one hour uh, e-learning before and so on. And uh, then you become the guide uh, who may be trusted. And of course, the website, ifidepression.eu, is very important uh, itself and can make the intervention itself, but uh, you need to remember about both and keep distinguishing it in your public communication. So work with both and uh, be aware why you work with what, uh, when and uh, how and so on. The context, uh, healthcare. Uh, context is, of course, the most desired one. But uh, don't forget about schools and don't forget about mental health and psychosocial support. That's something which uh, Interagency Standing Committee of United Nations uh, approves very much, that uh, the interventions in humanitarian contexts are somehow uh, simpler and, uh, and tailored to the special needs of, of the refugee populations, for example. I mentioned here this link, which you can take the photo of if you work with Ukraine displaced persons. That's called Mesur Mental Health Support for Ukrainian Refugees. That's another project which is kind of spin-off from the uh, EIND Best, uh, very successful spin-off, and uh, this Mesur project, uh, also funded by Hada from eu for health that may uh, bring uh, something catalytic to your uh, local intervention, especially if you work in the country which has uh, local refugee population already coming in and uh, traveling uh, later. The next lesson is about acquiring guides. Uh, take uh, this uh, picture, if you like, guidesifidepression.com. That's the website which uh, uh, has uh, visit cards for guides uh, when they pass the test, when they 
are uh, introduced there, it makes things easier. It's, it makes things easier to get them interested because uh, everyone wants to be acknowledged in a way, and this website uh, makes exactly this. It's acknowledgement of uh, being part of this pan-European uh, project. So acquiring guides is easier when you offer them visit cards on this website. That's the lesson. We build this website within the scope of this project. Then uh, the partnerships, you will need them. Uh, psychotherapists, psychologists, general practitioners, they all have their own associations, national ones usually. So talk to all of them. Not all of them will be uh, the first to come. GPs will usually be the last to come on board, but uh, if you are patient and keep uh, practicing, you will finally convince also general practitioners, family medicine. So uh, this may require a bit more hard uh, uh, work. Mm. National health care systems basically will not be very open to your intervention in a digital manner just because they are very analog still, uh, at least in the mental uh, health uh, part of uh, healthcare system. So you need to be ready to deal with resistance for at least some months. But uh, mm, that's also a very political issue sometimes. So, uh, so I don't have any uh, good uh, news here. We were not very successful with opening the national healthcare systems and making them really uh, eager to uh, to focus on i fight depression. Same about edu education systems. We were talking to ministries of education, not very easy talks, uh, a lot of uh, enthusiasm, but uh, very short enthusiasm. So uh, uh, ministries were not our best partners in this project. Uh, work with those who let you in, though. Uh, the followers who join late, even currently, the month number 35 shows uh, us uh, new uh, great partnerships in this project. Uh, be very patient until the last uh, day of this, uh, what you plan, because uh, it may uh, happen that, uh, that some uh, very uh, let's say a big uh, and uh, and enthusiastic followers will uh, come and uh, and join you in this activity, but uh, it will take time. Digital mental health as a concept is not currently seen as uh, very non-profit. It's seen as very commercial. So this is uh, actually a barrier for us because when we keep talking, it's free. Everyone says yes, it's free. It's probably freemium. You will make us pay in the future. So. Uh, Explaining that we will not make anyone pay is a difficult part of this job. And this very commercial approach to digital mental health, like everyone has their own startups currently and, uh, and promises something, is actually the barrier. It's not facilitator for us. Uh, that's not, oh, look, we are the only one for free. No one believes it. Uh, so be aware that uh, you enter a very competitive market, even with free tool. Uh, digital mental health is not yet trusted even by psychiatrists. When I go to psychiatrist conferences and ask them, not even mentioning that I have anything in my pockets uh, uh, waiting for deployment, uh, I, I see a lot of uh, distrust. So the concept of self-management is not very clear, even if you support it with clinical research, because uh, that's clinically tested tool. We have uh, papers. Even if you hand uh, in some papers, uh, you will see uh, some criticism. Uh, basically, people are not very uh, happy with learning new things, and self-management is quite a new concept, uh, I believe, in this uh, approach. Uh, only five or six lessons left, so uh, one, one more minute of patience. Uh, the growth pattern will be very uh, different in many contexts, but you can expect that they may happen nothing for long, that you keep talking and talking about high fi depression, no one cares, and suddenly everyone starts caring. So uh, don't stop talking about it, uh, don't stop convincing people that it's working, because uh, you may see really sudden jumps, uh, sometimes uh, even during the holiday. Uh, so <laughs> be, uh, uh, because they have less uh, work to do and they, f they can focus on this. Uh, so we saw some sudden jump, jumps in, in August, let's say, and, uh, and that was ready for a school uh, year for September, which was very good. Local guides, they need to be carefully selected. Uh, so I was talking a lot about uh, persuasive part of this uh, work, but don't be too persuasive. Uh, keep uh, your uh, boundaries because uh, those uh, who joined this uh, IFI depression uh, list of guides, they have to be uh, selected, double-checked, uh, because there's the issue of public trust and, and safety. Uh, not only for this particular tool, but for the whole category of digital mental health, which 
is very promising for the next uh, decades. And uh, expect more competition than cooperation because all dream about their own tools. When you start talking about uh, the tool which already is, uh, everyone, uh, not everyone, but many people will say, yes, we are working on something similar. It's almost there. Uh, so we'll not uh, deploy your tool because we almost have our own. But lesson 18 is that usually those tools will never be. Uh, no one will build their own tools for years. I remember people promising their own tools 36 months ago and they are not there. So th that's like the missed opportunity because this tool actually could save uh, health and lives and it didn't. Uh, number 19, that's uh, not the best news uh, from my viewpoint. I'm uh, part of so-called Team Europe Direct in the, uh, in the representation of, of Poland, and I keep uh, talking about this tool as connected to European Commission. It's sometimes facilitator, but sometimes it's a barrier, because uh, European Commission is uh, seen as, uh, um, as something very top uh, down and, uh, and some resistance, which is very natural for humans tends to occur when you uh, keep uh, showing the funding uh, from European Commission. So I don't know how to solve this particular problem because visibility is important and it facilitates many things very often, but sometimes it stops someone from getting involved in this uh, tool. So if you like, uh, you can still uh, join this uh, growth in Europe and globally, especially this month, because whatever you do this month will count to our success, which is quite remarkable. It's over 1,000 guides already, over 1,000 patients, and it's scalable for more. It's, it can easily be 10,000 if you uh, get your hands uh, on board. So join this uh, part of, of our work, uh, even if you don't want to set up your own alliance. Start from the digital parts, because uh, that can be stand alone in a way. Thank you very much. Thank you for your thoughtful talk. Are there questions? Digital questions. Um, Kyrgy. Yeah. The, thank you. Uh, the number nine and number ten was a little bit contradictory to me. For, I'm from Hungary. And uh, because you said that we need to establish relationship with the national, as, national associations of doctors, psychologists, etc. But we, we be aware about the national health care institution because they are they they show some resistance but that's a kind of contradiction because 80 percent of these these groups of people are the same people those people are part of the association national association who works for the national health care systems so one hand they are encouraged to join and the other hand they show resistance how <laughs> That's uh, quite natural that uh, we are ambivalent in our lives and we uh, say one thing, do another thing. So if you don't establish partnerships, you will never move forward. But if you establish them, expect that uh, even after you sign a cooperation treaty, you will see some resistance because uh, uh, associations uh, consist of thousands of people. Some of them are proponents, some of them are opponents, some of them build their own tools. And uh, basically, you uh, need to be just aware of the complexity of this work. Uh, for example, someone was very enthusiastic and stopped being enthusiastic. So you need to uh, work nav navigate in this complex uh, Part. Basically, uh, if I were about to uh, focus on something at first, I, first I would go to national CBT associations, cognitive behavioral therapy, because they uh, like this approach, uh, cognitive behavioral approach. The second uh, group would be psychologists, because they uh, like to uh, be included in mental health discussions. And uh, psychiatrists and GPs, paradoxically, uh, they uh, left uh, for later, uh, although they uh, even expressed some enthusiasm in most contexts, they did not uh, dive deeply into this. So that's how this paradox works, more or less. Our, our colleagues joining digitally have written a, a question. I, I read it, or is it shown here? No. Um, Haleva is, is asking, we are just newly emerging an alliance, uh, a newly emerging alliance. Have you got any suggestions how to cooperate efficiently and switch on as much NGO 
um, local government unit as it is possible. Um, also first, I, I would uh, recommend as much bottom-up as possible. Uh, if you are not forced to have a strong top-down element, it's, it, it's going forward faster and, and it's more easy uh, if you have a strong bottom-up and it's also more sustainable it's a bottom, if it's a bottom-up process. Um, if you have to involve um, other NGOs and uh, if you uh, want to get good cooperation, very helpful is that you have in the region the mayor on board and when you have also a very important spokesman on board. Uh, so uh, when you approach others for cooperation, um, the answer will be more often positive when you say this is a project supported by the mayor and this is um, uh, and, and also supported by, let's say, the most famous actor or sportsman of the region. Uh, this makes much things more easy. And then it's also important to address, uh, if you want to cooperate with an, as an organization, to address the people at the top and ask them for a conversation, not only write emails, um, but to ask for, for a personal meeting and uh, present it and ask them to support you and to come on board. Uh, this is what I have in mind, but Piotr, perhaps you, you, you would like to answer. So I uh, recently saw many NGOs that were enthusiastic in joining those local alliances. And uh, sometimes they even started with iFi depression, actually, because for NGOs it may be easier to do something which works than to wait for something that will work in the future. So getting NGOs on board might be a good strategy to begin with uh, iFi depression and wait for mayors, wait for officials, because NGOs are quite... Uh, uh, quite uh, quick and uh, sometimes they even like to do things named quick and dirty. That means uh, they don't uh, care very much about clinical testing and so on. They need to do something. That's this activity approach. There are actors in uh, local ecosystems. So working with NGOs, you may begin with uh, IFI depression. That's a good point. So thank you for this question. And it was the final question, unfortunately, because we are running behind on schedule. So uh, the next uh, step. Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure for me now. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's John Tal van Audenhoven, which is located in Leuven, so not far away, um, will now give the next talk. John Tal, thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you all for coming here. Uh, it's my task to talk about the evaluation of uh, the multi-level intervention. And uh, of course, evaluation is a very broad uh, concept. Um, evaluation tasks of uh, groups uh, like we are in Leuven uh, have a lot of uh, aspects eh? to map all the planned activities, to develop a monitoring instrument, to measure the processes and the output indicators to select validate, validated scales to evaluate outcome indicators, to coordinate data collection support to countries in ethical aspects and data security, to analyze monitoring and evaluation data, and to report on the monitoring and the evaluation data. This is a lot, too much for 10 minutes, eh? but uh, I will focus on specific aspects that might inspire you when you want to uh, set up such a program yourself. And I hope in the future that many of you will be inspired and uh, follow uh, these very interesting approaches. So uh, in the EAD BEST project, we had to make uh, creative choices. Uh, that was uh, necessary. And also, it was not a research project to show the effectivity that was already done. Eh? We were constricting further on these uh, data, on this scientific evidence. So uh, monitoring and uh, process uh, uh, and output indicators was the main topic, and we will report on this uh, yeah, 
very soon, at the end of March. But we also worked on the evaluation in a way that we thought was creative and could be helpful for local entities that want to evaluate their work themselves. Um, I will not go through all these aspects. You can read them quicker than I can. But we started from a specific theory. Uh, theory of plant behavior, that is a well-known cognitive psychological theory that is very interesting when you study health behavior. And health behavior is the behavior of a professional also who wants to uh, do the good things concerning prevention of suicide and depression in his encounters with patients or persons at risk. And so the most important uh, predictor of these behaviors is the intention eh, to do these behaviors, to perform like that. Eh? And attitudes, the belief that this, is, this will have a positive effect, for example, um, is very stimulating to have the intention, for example, to behave yeah, like you learn in the trainings. Eh? Um, but also the subjective norms. Yeah? When important others are role models for you, you will have the trend to follow them and indeed yeah, to go for these behaviors, for these education programs where you can learn it. Yeah? But also the point is, am I in the possibility to do this, yeah? to perform like this? The belief that you can do it will also be very positive towards doing the right things in your encounter, in your work. So these are lists of topics that are trained in the uh, level one training, uh, training for GPs. Uh, in our EAD best um, trainings, we saw that there were also many other uh, professionals close to the GPs, like nurses, but also mental health workers, psychologists, psychotherapists, psychiatrists who have followed these trainings. So recognizing signs and symptoms of depression, eh? asking about the symptoms of depression, making a diagnosis of depression, informing about depression, symptoms, causes, and treatments, discussing the treatment options with a patient, as a GP, for example, referring a patient with severe depression to specialized care, recognizing risk factors and warning signs for suicidality, exploring suicidal tendency, and also installing help at short notice when there is an acute danger. So these were all the topics that were present in the trainings. Eh? And uh, important for us was to see to what a degree the people who are participating in the trainings find this important, these behaviors. Is it important or very important that I can do this? Eh? And at the same time, the question was asked, to what degree are you doing this in real practice? Eh? And here I have marked in red a very important group, eh? a group that finds it at the same time very important or important, but scores it as, I do this seldom or never. When we have an overview of this group, we know these are the people with whom we have to work. Eh? And this is very important when you do a training to see if after the training, the people responding in those categories are diminished. There are more at the other sides of this framework. And here you see the results of our level one training for general practitioners with the combination of importance and the performance. And what you see is that at the baseline, the installing help at short notice, for example, in case of acute suicidality, 72% says that they are finding this very important or important, but seldom or never do it. The follow-up at the end of the training was a question, to what degree do you plan to do this, eh? because of course eh? it was necessary to ask their intention. Eh? And there you see that there is an important diminishment in all the categories. So you see that these trainings have an effect on the people's intention to perform in the right way. Eh? Of course, 30% is still a lot. Eh? There is still 
room for improvement after the training. Eh? It's also a point on which we have to reflect when we see this type of data. This is the generic overview of all the data we have, eh? but you could make it also for specific locations and compare and see what makes this difference. Eh? Are there specific reasons why some eh, trainings have scored very high and other less? Eh? And, uh, another item that is also uh, very important to uh, take into consideration is the feeling of being competent. And here you have the same uh, figures. Huh? You see, for example, installing help at short notice in case of acute uh, suicidality at baseline. Nearly 35% says that they find it very important or important, but they feel only little or not competent to do this. At follow-up, it is reduced to nearly 13%. So it's becoming better, but it can still um, be, uh, become more better. So for the level three training, we have the same list of um, competencies that are trained, except the more medical ones, like making a diagnosis or um, yeah, detecting the, the symptoms of depression, for example, which are typically for medical uh, professionals. And we have the same type of data. You see they are all in the same direction. There is an improvement but it can still better when it is 30% afterwards. Here again, um, for the people who are uh, not medical, but uh, are community facilitators, we see that the training has effect in the direction we expect and we want. So also for the iFi depression tool, and it was already mentioned, uh, we expect an improvement of mental well-being in persons with mild to moderate symptoms of depression who use this tool. And it's relatively easy to uh, detect that. We have a lot of data, of course. I see that I'm in my last minute from my 10 minutes. I cannot go into the details, but um, we uh, have uh, the brought together the data from people who completed two workshops. We read 70% of the content within six weeks. Those were considered to have a minimal doses uh, necessary for the effectiveness of the tool. Um, yeah, I'm not going into the details here, but what we found was that the users um, that we have uh, studied here in this group are neutral towards medical treatment. It's not that they are against it, huh? but they accept uh, medical treatment as well as this I fight depression tool. They're motivated to deal with the problems themselves. Huh? People who are relatively empowered huh? and they believe also to some extent that such an online tool can be helpful. They have positive expectations and hope against the use of this tool, but they also value the personal contact with a professional. It's not a standalone tool, and this comes also out of the, um, uh, the answers of the users of the iFight depression tool. The effects on the PHQ-9, which is a very sensitive instrument to assess depression symptoms, and you see here a list of these symptoms, you recognize them, a little interest or pleasure, feeling down, trouble, falling asleep, etc., etc. It's a very good instrument to assess in scientific research, and it is used here, it's included in, in the tool. We used it here pre and post, and more visits of the iFight depression uh, tool corresponds with an improvement in depressive symptoms. So this is what we advise. Use it as such, and you will see if it goes in the right direction and if it stays like that. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, dear Chantal. Other questions? Yeah, Ella. Hi, Chantal. Excellent presentation and obviously very, very encouraging uh, outcomes. Um, very consistent. Uh, and I would say even, even despite the fact that this wasn't a controlled design. Eh? So, so, it's, so we have to also take that into account. 
It is very encouraging to see that in addition to uh, the knowledge and the attitudes measures of, of which we know from previous EAD projects that there have been very consistent improvements across community, facilit community facilitator groups, GPs, etc. But what would you particularly see as, let's say, innovative from the EAD best approach in terms of impacts on the more behavioral uh, aspects mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of people due to the training? Thank you. Well, of course, I think behavioral aspects, we had not the opportunity to assess it in real life. Eh? So uh, I, I would think that uh, when you would uh, register the encounters, you had, had, would be more close to, eh? uh, I think that's, that's not possible. I think what is interesting here is that you could use this as an organization on yourself eh, to see if you have such an educational training, if afterwards you have gained improvement, and it can be different. There are locations probably where it would not be in the same direction or where you have remarkable results. And there, I think, it helps you to make the discussion about what can we do better, where do we still have to learn in a learning process, a learning organization, this type of uh, approach is helping people to reflect as a group at the organizational level on their um, progress and on the points of improvement that are still there. And that's why I think this is uh, another step that we didn't do in the previous uh, project. Of course, we are not so far yet that each subregion and each group has its own uh, data. This could be uh, something that we could uh, do. Eh? And uh, some of the groups have very small numbers of respondents. Yeah, then it's difficult. But it's also a data when you have a small group, yeah, why do you have a small group and other locations have big groups? Yeah, that also gives some reflection. Uh, thank you, Chantal. I'm also thinking there are people here who may be starting uh, an alliance or at least may be starting one of the interventions. And then I would still encourage people maybe to um, include some minimal levels of evaluation because also in, in Ireland we, well, we can now show many consistent peer review papers to the government uh, officials to say, yeah, this is very consistent evidence, but they, they want to see it again and again and also continuously in recent times. And maybe one thing to consider is uh, to, to monitor and evaluate impacts of training also on cases or vignettes, eh? so whereby at baseline you can see how would people have responded or how would they respond to certain complex cases in terms of depression and suicidal behaviour and how would they do this after the training, because a certain level of evaluation remains important to, to start with EAD or to sustain EAD and ideally with some government uh, funding. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's indeed a very interesting uh, addition. Huh? Yeah. Good morning again, and thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. As a behavioral economist, I was pretty much impressed about your slide on the intention to perform the behavior and the behavior. Because there, I think, would be interesting, I don't know if it was part of your analysis, the peer pressure. How much the fact that your peers, uh, in looking for instance at the GPs or people in the government, have performed the behavior that you are not yet performed will impact on the actual behavior as such. So I was just wondering, curious if that was part of your analysis as well. Well, we did not analyze this in this project. It was not our ambition to focus on the whole uh, theory of planned behavior. But what you say is very much correct. Huh? Uh, when you study uh, behavior of uh, people, uh, health behavior, you see that the social norm is very important. Huh? For example, a very old study was that the behavior of doctors against smoking eh, is very much controlled by their social context. In countries where everybody smokes, also the physicians smoke, whereas their cognitive knowledge about the effects of smoking is the same everywhere. So that's very important. But it can also go the other way around. Eh? When you are an adolescent and you don't want to resemble on your father, you will need the other thing than what an important other things is best for you. So this is very important. 
And I think the role models eh, are very important and can also be the focus of the study. It can be a result also for further analysis. Why doesn't it work here? Because maybe the role model here is not the one we need. Eh? Thank you again, Thank you. Um, dear Chantal. <laughs> so we come now to the um, question and answer session. Perhaps we shorten it a little bit, but I do not want to skip it. Um, let's see if there are questions to the whole team, uh, here the best team. Um, yeah, perhaps uh, those who have been speaking right now, Chantal, uh, Rainer, Piotr, perhaps you come on the stage. And let's see if there are any questions. If this is not the case, no problem. We have enough time to discuss it in um, the workshops. Please, there is already. Yeah, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much. Very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, my name is Eric van Rijken. I'm a, a patient expert person with lived experience. I know exactly what the depression means. And I'm uh, working for a GAMI in Europe, which is a European umbrella organization for patient organization. What I, un uh, I have a question. <laughs> uh, what I understood, as far as I could, could see in the slides, you have implemented these or you did this rollout of uh, alliances in six, seven, eight countries, I think, yeah? But there were more partners in the project. So, for instance, like Belgium was one of the partners and, and, and I, th I think there was Spain, Greece and other. Now, my question is, as being a member of a patient organization, in these countries where, they did, where you did roll out these alliances, was there any interaction, was there any relevance of uh, members that were in that alliance or helping in that alliance that were also members of orga uh, patient organizations? Because this is for me an interesting possible interaction that you get peer support, that you get this type of uh, yeah, effect in, into this alliance. Who wants to answer? I have to answer to it. Um, in uh, Poland, there is the foundation named F. Kropka, and it consists of both doctors and patients. So when we were looking for this level of the alliance, of the intervention, whom to contact and with whom work, uh, other patient organizations were less interested than the one focused on mental health that consists of both doctors and patients. So this one was very active in the alliance and in the activities present on the materials and so on. Uh, I don't know if uh, we were able to find similar organizations in all intervention regions, but there are some cases like this to which I can refer you. Maybe I can add one point. Um, I think it was really important, and we, we did, uh, one of the patient organizations did join in Estonia, for example, in the regional alliance as well. But what happened during the process was one of the uh, members of the alliance actually, she had her own uh, mental health issues at one point, and she started a brand new organization based on the experiences that she learned uh, while she was uh, doing very involved in the project. So something new actually grew out of the alliance, which I think is terrific. Yeah, Francis Madejo from APAS, from Kenya. Thank you. I'm Francis. Uh, from Kenya. I represent uh, an organization called uh, African Project Against Suicide as the International Secretary for Africa. Uh, my question will be a little bit different because it will not be European based, it will be African based. Uh, but um, this is a real learning session for me and I'm really glad that I'm here to be able to learn so much from your intervention. Uh, my first question will be uh, piloting the four level approach. Uh, in a different context, uh, what will you advise? Um, let me give you a scenario of, uh, let's say in Africa, where uh, few of the population is digital, big of the population is, uh, is analog, uh, so you have to do a hybrid system. 
uh, and the same goes with data issues. Uh, nobody collects data, shares data on such issues, uh, except maybe the health practitioners. So how would you pilot such a, an intervention in Africa or in a different context? Uh, and is it scalable to a, a larger level based on those contexts? Thank you. But I can answer because we are um, very thankful yeah, that you have come and that there is interest in cooperating because it's an area we have to learn. No? That because we have experience in Europe, experience also in South America, in Australia, where it has been adopted, but up to now no regional alliance has been uh, implemented in Africa. And to do it together would be a great pleasure. No? Of course, one. One point we have to consider is that you need a strong top-down element. Yeah? You can do nothing without a, a paper of memorandum um, with the ministry. So uh, this is very important in Africa when you want to start it. Uh, I think it will be uh, a good opportunity to involve a lot of volunteers. Um, I think also you can do it in low cost, a lot of things. Um, I think some of the materials already have been adapted to Africa. We, uh, we, have, we have, you know, even uh, Mandinka and Wolof uh, versions. This is West Africa, not, not Kenya, uh, uh, for the web page. And we might in the future translate also um, other elements in different African languages. So how to implement it um, is something we have to sit together and think in detail who has to be involved, what is the regional alliance we have to form, who has to be involved, um, and um, what has been done. But I'm quite convinced that the basic structure, these four levels, can be preserved. Uh, the content has to be modified, but otherwise it has turned out to be very flexible. Um, who might be the NGO, who is running it, is also a question uh, to consider. I would, according to my experiences, think it's better that it's an NGO than that it's a ministry, uh, because the ministry, the personal changes, and then easily also a uh, project gets stuck. So an NGO who has a cooperation with the ministry would be probably the optimal structure. This is up to now my, my thoughts, but I think you know it better than I do. And this is something we would be very happy to learn. No? So thank you for coming, Francis. Uh, good morning. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Yeva Kardash. I am from uh, I'm from Ukraine, but uh, now I work in Amsterdam with Ukrainian refugees. Work as psychologist, and Peter, I think, present us already. I fight depression. We start to a little bit show it for people, and. I, I don't know, maybe question, maybe ask for a recommendation. I already have a lot of people who used it, and they need also monitoring. They need someone to check them. I check, other psychologists who work with me check, but uh, I think it's need to, to have more and more people, uh, professionals, who can do it. And maybe you have some, I don't know, um, presentation or programs that can show to other people, professionals, that they will want to help other people, like patient. How to involve more specialists to work with people with your no. tool? I know this uh, issue of um, specialists being not always uh, very enthusiastic at first and sometimes reluctant. Those are all those barriers I mentioned. We work uh, with technical working groups of MHPSS usually. Uh, in m most countries, WHO and UNHCR, the United Nations agencies, they set up the groups consisting sometimes from half thousand institutions even, working in the field. So networking the organizations in which you work, the OPORA, I guess, uh, with other organizations would be the solution. But uh, it's not always very easy because those technical working groups of, uh, uh, of United Nations agencies are not very visible in public space. You have to go and ask, but uh, those networks exist, and I'm sure that in the Netherlands they exist too. 
Netherlands it's easier, of course, but I also work with Ukrainians in Ukraine. In Ukraine, yes. And there is a because sometimes they move to U European Union, then go back, and so on. So that no, technical the group, who stays there, who was always there. The technical working group uh, in Ukraine exists as well. I can refer you to the group there. It's uh, quite big. I every week I receive uh, several emails from them about what they are doing. So. Oh, okay, so it's good. Yes, message. they are very active. It's yes. not just the stamp that they exist. They are very Thank active. you very much. Thank you. I would like to uh, maybe ask you something, if I may. So um, we have one more project, Mental Health Support for Ukrainian Refugees, ongoing right now, and we are actually trying to do this. We are trying to um, uh, disseminate this tool and information to uh, mental health practitioners um, who might be actually be themselves from Ukraine. So this actually is a very important question, and maybe this is something that you could hear tell me or us what do you need or what would be helpful uh, to disseminate this information to this specific group. Could you tell me or us? Yeah, I think you need to... If you want to do it in Ukraine, yeah? To, or in, in, in European countries. In but in Ukraine, theoretically as well. But let's say let's say European countries with refugees. Yeah, in European countries, I need more info give more information for people and show how it works, because people want to have it, but they don't know how to ask and where to ask. We in, in Amsterdam, we work Ukrainian psychologists <coughs> for Ukrainians, and people easier to talk with us because we are Ukrainians. All We have helpline for yeah. Ukrainian people, they call us, and then we give them uh, several possibilities what they can do. We also use uh, different initiative for mental health and just show them you can yeah. use this, this, or this. Yeah. And when explain to them, then, yeah. then they go there. Okay. So this is really interesting. Maybe at a later point yeah. we can get touch base and then yeah, yeah. talk about this. Yeah? <laughs> okay, thank you. thank you. Okay, so we, um, I think we are too much over time. Uh, please come to me in the, in the break. We shorten the break to 20 minutes and we start the workshops 15 minutes later um, so that we have, I think, some time for taking a coffee. Um, I'm very happy that the discussion now slowly starts to become more intense and I think much more intense it will become in the workshop, hopefully. So let's enjoy our coffee. Thank you. Oh, no, one moment, one moment. Because we... Um, we have two workshops actually happening at the same time. Uh, oh, the slides are gone. Well, it doesn't matter. We have two workshops um, on the same topic at the same time. Um, and so we would like to ask half of you, I would say maybe this bigger half here, to stay, to come back to this room here. So everyone who's sitting on that side, please come back to this room. And those people on the other side, um, we would like you to ask to go to the second workshop, which is in the smaller room, 311, so it's just where you entered on the right-hand side. Um, and there we will do the same thing, just to have a smaller group to um, encourage more discussion. Okay, thank you. That's not